Good morning. I'd like to call the Committee on Health and Human Services to order. Um, we, it's Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, and we have a quorum present. Today we will first um, take up um, Senate File 73, which we, were, we um, were working on last week, and Senator Port is here again to discuss, uh, resume discussion of the bill. So um, I think we were at the point of questions and amendments, and um, I don't know, Senator Port, did you have any further comments or you want to make to as we get started today? No, just thank you um, for, for taking the time to have the full discussion on this. I appreciate it. Um, I think we are waiting for a couple of amendments from me that are being printed and coming down. Okay. But uh, we can go back to the conversations we were having before. All right. So. Apparently, we have the amendments here, so those are available. Um, do you want to start with those? Um, or that, Senator are Abler had an amendment uh, on the. Okay. Do you have copies? I do not. When you have copies, then please, uh, if you could let me know which one you would like to offer first. Sure. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Port. If we could move the A71 first, please. Uh, Senator Mann moves the A71 amendment. It'll be passed out. Senator Port, do you want to describe your amendment? Thank you, Chair Wickland. Uh, this is a very simple amendment. Last week when we met, uh, we added recovery uh, to uh, the portion of the bill, uh, to a portion of the bill in prevention, treatment, and recovery. Uh, recovery was missed on one line, so this just adds in uh, the recovery portion that was missed on that line. Members, any, any questions about the A71 amendment? Um, okay, seeing no questions, all those in favor of the A71 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Uh, the amendment is adopted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Senator Port, do you have another amendment? Yes, if we can move the A73. Senator Mann, would you move the A73, please? So moved. And the amendment will be passed out, the A73. Thank you. Senator Port, do you wish to... Can you describe the amendment, please? I can, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an amendment that we have been working on with NAMI um, to address a number of the concerns that they have in this bill. Um, so it does, it does a couple of things. Um, first, it 
uh, collects data from uh, state courts and hospitals uh, on the utilization of mental health and substance use disorders, emergency room visits, and things like that. So we're actually gathering the information to learn about the increase of, of uh, visits and uh, the services that are required and um, obtains a summary so that we are making sure we're collecting that data to find out uh, if there are increases in Minnesota. Um, it also adds uh, child welfare workers to a portion of the bill uh, that is, let's see, line 21. I'll skip over that one for a moment while we pull that up. Uh, requires that cannabis flower and cannabinoid products must be inaccessible to children and stored away from food products, warning labels uh, like that, uh, inserts uh, the Commissioner of Human Services to develop the uh, programs that are under treatment rather than the uh, Commissioner of Health, and uh, that we adopt evidence-based, culturally informed and responsive treatments and services, uh, that funds are used to uh, pr promote the expansion of peer and recovery specialists, uh, which is a particular uh, piece we wanna talk about. That is the most effective way that we have found uh, in all of the research in the other states that sort of peer-to-peer -peer education is the most effective, uh, both in preventing first use and also through recovery. Uh, the more support you have from your peer network and the more you're able to get accurate information from your peer network, the more um, it, the more useful it is, the more it sticks and, and it actually curbs behavior. So um, that is a piece that we wanted to build out in this. Um, the final sort of big thing that this does is it deletes the Substance Use Advisory Council that's created in this bill and instead points back to the Substance Use and Opioid Council that the governor already has. We discussed that a bit last week um, and in talking with DHS, with the governor's office, um, and with treatment and recovery experts, they, they say these, this would be a duplicative council and that that council actually is already doing the work across the state and they would rather have it just point directly to that council. Thank you. Members, any questions about this amendment? <clears throat> Seeing no, um, no questions, uh, um, on the A73 amendment, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. The motion is, does pass and the amendment is adopted. And the final one I'll be offering, Madam Chair, is the A-72. Senator Mann, would you offer the A-72, please? So moved. And the A-72 will be passed out. Thank you. Senator Port, do you want to describe the A-72, please? Yes, this adds into um, the sort of list of warnings that uh, need to be developed by the office. Um, a particular warning label requiring the, uh, regarding the effects of use of cannabis flower and cannabinoid products for persons 25 years of age or younger. Um, this is a, a portion we've talked about um, that throughout uh, testimony here, and um, there are several places in the bill where we have peer-to-peer -peer education, where we have public service education and things like that, but we um, are also adding a warning label. Members, any questions or comments on the amendment? Seeing no questions, um, 
on the A72 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion does pass and the amendment is adopted. Any further amendments? That's what I am uh, have to move. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving to member amendments, are there any further am amendments? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Madam Chair. And I, I don't know if you have a new copy available, but I don't even remember the number or what it was, but it's the one to change the age from 21 to 25. Um, I'm seeing that council has the amendment. I don't know. Do you have, or you don't? M Madam okay. Chair, it was a, the A63. Okay. I'll move the A63. And, okay. And I don't know if we need a copy. It just, everywhere it says 21, it makes it 25. There's about a dozen citations, I think. All the rest of the bill stays the same. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last thing you said. Oh, and it doesn't change anything else in the bill. Okay. It just changes the age. And I'm happy to, uh, so I'll move it and then I'll offer a comment and we can discuss it. Senator Abler moves the A63 amendment. Um, Senator Port, do you have any comments? Thank you, that? Madam Chair. Um, again, I ask members to vote no on this. Uh, as sort of an, a country, we have agreed that at the age of 21, you are adults. Um, and we are providing ample um, education, uh, specifically the kinds of education in this bill that we have found uh, through studies in other states have been effective to um, actually get that information to young people about the dangers. We, but at some point, um, they're adults, and we have to trust that they will take the information and use it uh, to make the best decisions for themselves. Um, also, you know, I would add that alcohol has adverse effects on the brain. Um, no one is, is calling to move the legal age of drinking to 25. Uh, brain development, beyond brain development, both alcohol and tobacco have significantly uh, stronger health concerns, um, and we are not sort of singling them out in that way. My, my biggest argument is that this bill is built on the premise that prohibition has not worked. It is a failed system that has not kept cannabis out of the hands of our communities, and our communities have paid a very high cost for that. If, if our goal is really to have people from the age of 21 to 25 not use cannabis, why would we focus on a failed prohibition system that has not been effective at doing that so far. Instead, we should focus on the things that we know that work, which is peer-to-peer -peer education, which is getting public service education out there, um, which is you know, working through those systems that we know can be effective. Uh, if we were to raise the age of 25, we would be essentially shining a spotlight on young people for the illicit market to target them. Um, and our goal in this bill is to work and use the best practices that we have across other states to stamp out the illicit market. This would be sort of shining a spotlight to them um, to target our young people. And so for that reason, I ask for a no vote. Members, any further discussion or comments about the amendment? Senator Abler. Well, I'm not going to blabber. We discussed this a little bit before, but I... I, I agree that you want to protect the young people from the illicit market, but I also don't agree that we need to neglect every scientific opinion about the harm of this particular product. Uh, even in your last amendment, you know, there's a warning label about under age 25. Um, when it's age 21 with a warning label, uh, they're gonna, the kids are going to blow this warning label up and hang it on their wall in their dorm room uh, because it's going to be funny. Uh, because it's no big deal. We heard uh, the good governor of Ventura saying if you're able to be in the military, you should be able to smoke a joint because it's just that casual, no big deal. Um, and so just I talked with some uh, drug people this morning. Uh, the, the growth in drug treatment these days, the fast growth is in marijuana. In the current circumstances, when we make it legal, there will be more. Uh, in your second amendment, you talked about more treatment. You talked about uh, first, ev first episode of psychosis. You talked about uh, emergency room visits. You talked about mental health uh, programs and, in, 
and they're going to increase. They increase everywhere this goes. And so the oath that uh, everybody in the industry who does healthcare, you try to avoid doing harm. Um, and one that's above all, do no harm. Um, I took a similar oath. Uh, you know, we have a duty to people to not send them down a course. Uh, the Minnesota Medical Association agrees it should be 25. And so you want to put a warning label on this. You say, you can't get it to your 25. I don't care if we criminalize it under 25, but if you, like we have a smoking thing where you can buy cigarettes when you're 21, but you can smoke them when you're 18. That's goofy. But actually, somebody thought it made sense and maybe it's helping reduce smoking. And so, um, I don't know where the votes are, um, and, but I can tell you, passing this bill with 21 will harm people. Passing this bill with 21 will make more cases of the mom who sat there about her son with psychosis who was age 22, who tragically killed himself. Uh, passing this bill at age 21 will cause harm. And I can't remember a time in this body where we passed a bill that we know will cause harm. And that's why I urge members to, uh, to vote for 25, put a, big thing, put a big star on there. It's not my goal to derail the bill, but it's my goal to make the bill that we pass be one that actually you can have some confidence that people that follow the law will actually not come to harm. So that's all I got, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is uh, something that I've been struggling with quite a bit. Um, as you know, and um, so uh, I was leaning towards this entire time voting for the, the age increase. However, last night I spoke to um, several people, uh, including law enforcement, uh, fellow physicians, um, people from Colorado. Um, I, I made a whole night of it, it was wonderful. Um, and a couple things stood out in my mind. One is this, this notion that we as a society have decided that 21 makes you an adult. I don't know if I agree necessarily. I remember being 21 and being a complete idiot, but that's what we have decided collectively. And um, I don't think that People should smoke marijuana at that young age, right? I don't think people should drink alcohol at 21. But again, we have decided that we're gonna allow people to make their own choices at 21. The other thing is that if we, that was brought to my attention, I guess, is that if we take that group of people and we say that you cannot do this, they're, they're already doing it, right? Um, 21 year olds, 20 to 25, they're, they're already using, if they're gonna use marijuana, they're already using marijuana. Um, and in the states that have legalized it, the use for that age group, 21 to 25, did not increase. And that stuck out to me quite a bit. Instead, what happened in that age group was that they're able to get a legal product that is regulated instead of getting fentanyl-laced products on the street. And so, <sighs> While it's still very difficult for me because, you know, I work in the ER, I see, I have a very skewed vision of what happens when there is alcohol use and drug use. Um, I, I completely understand the other side, and I think that if we want to, to do our best to not alienate people, to not f put fire under an illegal market, to make sure people are getting a safer product, then, um, I think uh, voting uh, for keeping it at 21 is the right thing to do. Thank you, Senator Mann. Um, any other comments or questions? Then I will, we will move to a vote. Um, and on the A63 amendment offered by uh, Senator Abler, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. No, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the discussion and I appreciate um, that this is a still an important topic, but thank you very much.
Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, are there any other amendments that members have? Um, Senator Liskey? Uh, so I know Senator Hoffman was talking about carrying this, but uh, I also offered to carry it if he wasn't here. Uh, so I move the A70 amendment. <laughs> Senator Liskey moves the A70 amendment. That will be passed out. Senator Liskey, can you describe the amendment while we're looking at it? I'll do the best I can. Um, so the amendment uh, basically describes that a a study will be done on the reservations uh, in order to see any, uh, if there's any increases in use or things of that nature. So I believe that's the, the basics of what this amendment is going to try and do. Let, let Senator Port, do you have any uh, reaction or, or response? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, Senator Liskey, I'm, I'm wondering if, has there been conversations with the tribes on this? I've been speaking with them quite a lot and have not had a conversation about this piece. Uh, Madam Chair. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, as far as I know, they have. Uh, Senator Green was uh, in conversation with the tribes, um, and he had offered this as a possible amendment for this committee, and so since he's not sitting on it, he asked myself and Senator Hoffman to kind of look into what the possibility of carrying these forward just so that we can have that information um, readily available. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at this point, I would ask for a no vote on this. Um, I, I'm not sure that this is the place to um, do research on the number of murders and uh, death rates. Uh, especially considering in my, my many conversations with the tribes, I have not uh, heard this at all. Um, so I would ask for a no vote. Senator Abler. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Port, is this bill going to the Human Services Committee next? It is. All right. Well, Madam Chair, I just have a suggestion that, um, you know, none of us have seen this, and I don't know if it's a good amendment or not, and certainly how could Senator Hoffman not have a good amendment? I, right. that's, that just seems to be impossible to me. But uh, since we're going to go to the committee chairs, and this would give, now that the amendment is out there, it seems like a benefit will have been served. There it is, and then people can react. And, and so maybe you want to just consider waiting on it. So that's all I got. Uh, thank you. Senator Liskey? Madam Chair, I will remove the amendment for now, and we'll let it have consideration in the next committee. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Senator Liskey withdraws the A70 amendment, and I think that would be good to have the discussion with um, those that are involved and Senator Port and, and really discuss whether these statistics, capturing these statistics would really be um, something that would be meaningful and of interest. So, uh, Any other amendments? Uh, members, do you have any final comments or discussion before we go to the author? Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I've got a number of questions that I would like to go through uh, with the author to uh, get some additional information. Um, and I'm going to just take them as I've got them tabbed and roll forward. Um, under the definitions, um, and, and these things are going to come up in various points throughout the bill, but it uh, just happens to be the way I've got them. But you've got bona fide labor organization, and you highlight that. Why? Um, it appears that you are um, specifically saying that all employees are members of a organized labor unit. Is that correct, and why? That is correct, Senator yes. Senator Port. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, sorry. Uh, and Senator Aki, um, yes, as we're setting up this new industry, we want to ensure that it has good paying, good benefit jobs for Minnesotans. Um, and so a uh, portion of this bill, which will be discussed in, in length at in the Labor Committee uh, on Thursday, I believe, um, does require a labor peace agreement. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess my only comment there, and I would, uh, I'll follow to see what, uh, what we see come out of the uh, jobs committee, or is it the labor committee, you said? Yeah. Um, but 
the fact that they're an organized labor unit does not, you, you mentioned good pay and, and benefits, that doesn't signify that that is the case. I mean, it, it could be um, the other way too. So um, I will I'll wait to see what additional comes out. I just happened to uh, see it a little differently there. Um, on page six, the Division of Social Equity promotes development, stability, and safety in communities that have experienced a disappropriate negative impact from cannabis prohibition and usage. And, and I know that's going to come up here uh, later again, too, uh, in the bill, but why would not having legalized cannabis be a problem? I mean, I don't see where we're targeting and saying we've got communities that are suffering because they don't have that. Um, we're going to see as we go even further into the bill the fact that um, it, it's acknowledging the fact we're going to need more SUD services. We're going to need more, uh, we're going to have challenges with the young people. We're going to have all these problems. Um, just trying to understand why that is a problem, not having it. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Uckey. Um, what this really is getting at is that um, across the country and true in Minnesota is that uh, people of color and white people use cannabis at roughly the same rate, uh, nearly identical rates. Yet they are prosecuted at significantly different rates, over four to one, uh, that, that black people are prosecuted for having cannabis, for using cannabis uh, at a much, much higher rate than white people. And what this gets at is that there has been a discriminatory cost to cannabis prohibition that has affected certain communities more than others. And so what this is trying to get at is if you are a part of a community that has been targeted and really paid a much higher cost than uh, any other community that we want to ensure that as cannabis is no longer prohibited and as a legal market is setting up, and I'm sure you'll get to this in your questions, that you have a stake, you have the ability to get into this industry that has caused such, such drastic harm through our community, through particularly black Minnesotans communities. Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I think, yeah, the answer kind of got away from what this little section was talking about. Um, this is just talking about they didn't have, you know, it wasn't available. Um, we're going into uh, uh, the legal side, more of a, the arrests and such. Um, I, I don't see a connection there, but anyhow, um, the next one I saw that was uh, something that concerned and I would uh, look for a little more information on is uh, on page eight, the labor peace agreement. And it goes on to talk about it protects the state's interests. And why would that be the case? Uh, basically from what I'm seeing it is the uh, organized labor employee group that would be working there is not allowed to picket or have a work stoppage, et cetera, around this cannabis business. But why does that protect the state's interest? Uh, Senator Port, or? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, can I introduce my expert as well and have her take this one? Yes, please state your name for the record and you can answer the question. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Laylee Fadahi. I'm the campaign director for MN is Ready. Uh, and we have been working for several years and especially over the last few months to really do much of the uh, policy research and stakeholder engagement towards making improvements to this bill. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rutke, the labor peace agreement provision, it doesn't require that the entirety of the workforce in the cannabis industry be unionized, but it requires labor peace agreements because one of the 
since one of the major public policy goals of this bill is to eliminate the illicit market and to ensure that there is adequate supply of well-regulated product um, that is safe and available to consumers, the concern from a state interest perspective with having a uh, labor issue uh, that interferes with supply is that that would then push uh, consumers to purchasing their products from an illicit market where they are less safe and unregulated. Uh, labor peace agreements are not uncommon in situations like that where there's issues of health and safety uh, of public interest that might be disrupted or, or uh, uh, compromised because of a labor dispute. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I guess just a little bit of a comment. Um, the fact that this would, <laughs> it, it, well, it was brought up, so I'll comment on it, that the illicit market's going to go away. That is, from everything I have see, hear, read, et cetera, over the last number of years, is it doesn't happen. That's a pipe dream. Um, and in some cases it grows because now we expose young people to the product, maybe through a legal purchase, but uh, it leads to the illicit market. So, um, you know, I, I don't see that as, uh, again, uh, anything that pertains to controlling or reducing. Um, it seems like this is only going to expand the use of this product. Um, I get up to page 15, and you've got a medical cannabis program. It talks about the duties of the Department of Health. Um, this is all being moved, particularly the medical cannabis, from the Department of Health to this new office. But how is that relationship between the Department of Health and this new office, how do you see that working? I mean, um, the, this, particularly the medical, medical cannabis is still a so-called health product. Um, they're going to have to work together. Do, where do you see that? How do you see that working? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Aki. Um, there are multiple provisions in this bill, particularly as it gets to the medical cannabis program um, pieces, where they work in tandem with each other. Um, they, they will work together. However, putting it all under one for the um, licensing, for regulations, for testing, for all of those pieces um, makes more sense than leaving that sort of off to the side under the Department of Health. Um, we do have folks from DHS here today. If, if you have additional questions on that that you'd like to ask them. Um, Senator Atke, do you have an Yeah, uh, Madam Health Chair, I think we should. I mean, this is the Health Committee, and uh, um, I think it's important to hear that. Uh, Department of Health is here, and Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record. Thank you. Good and morning. Um, my name is Chris Thokas, and I'm the director of the medical cannabis program at the Minnesota Department of Health. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Atke, do you want to phrase your question to or further? Up to sure. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question was, um, we see everything moving, I mean, it's establishing on the recreational side a new office for the cannabis, but it's also bringing along the medical cannabis, which would have a direct relationship as far as it's part of health care, um, and it's being moved over. How do you see, you know, my question was about the working relationship, uh, because, because it's still prescribed as a health product, the relationship between the new office and the current Department of Health. Um, will you still be involved or what, how do you see that or what do you, I mean, it's, it's all kind of proposed, it's still on paper, but how do you read it? Uh, testify, I'm sorry, your last name again? Focus. Focus. Um, Ms. Focus. Madam Chair, Senator Udke, 
Um, the, the bill maintains the medical program, the definitions of medical cannabis products. Um, it, it maintains the structure of the Office of Medical Cannabis that is, as it operates today. Um, it does create new license categories for the manufacturers, but largely the, the office will maintain the way that it operates today. Um, the, the way that we operate as an agency right now is we do have very strong relationships with other agencies. For example, um, the medical cannabis program has a very strong relationship with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture right now, and we look to them for their expertise on cultivation and pesticide use and other things that are a little bit out of the wheelhouse of the Minnesota Department of Health. And I would imagine that a similar relationships with other agencies as needed um, would be what happens with the Office of Cannabis Management, that they would tap into other areas of expertise through interagency agreements or um, informal conversations for subject matter experts as needed. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you. That's what I was looking for. So, uh, Madam Chair, if I could, um, there's another, actually right in that same area, we talk about making loans and grants for these, these programs. What type of money or amounts do you see as being used in loans and grants? Because uh, uh, to me, and I just, I'll throw it out there so you can respond to it to, to let us know what these loans and grants will end up doing. But to me, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's bringing a uh, cannabis dispensary to a neighborhood near you. Um, is, what is the, the, the idea behind this and how big will it be? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Utke. Um, there are not fiscal numbers in this bill yet. Uh, we're still waiting for the fiscal notes and those will be added. But um, what I can tell you about the um, about the programs is that these are essentially to, to help people get into a brand new industry. We're going to need to set up a, a rather robust industry. Um, we don't want it to be one or two sort of huge conglomerates who have the whole market. So our goal with setting up these, these programs, both for growers, um, to give business expertise, to open, uh, you know, whichever level of licensing you have to do education around that. Um, though the idea is to help people, and there is a social equity component to this as well, um, from communities who have been harmed and people who want to get into this industry, to be able to enter at as smaller Minnesota-based businesses. Um, what we were really trying to avoid here is having one or two of the big guys from out of state come in and own the whole market. We really want to give an opportunity for Minnesotans to, to run this market um, in small businesses in ways that can grow, um, but do not rely on one or two very large uh, stakeholders. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, one of my questions later on, because that's at the end of the bill, was going to be, what if we heard about a fiscal note? I mean, we're, we're nine weeks into the um, session. You definitely had this bill available prior to session. Uh, do we have any idea when we're going to see these numbers? That's an excellent Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Aki. I do not. Um, I know we got another portion of it uh, was was filled out, but we are still waiting on the full fiscal note. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, you know, uh, in, interested, I just uh, see things I've highlighted. As far as some of these studies that are required, um, driving impaired and such, I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time and effort on these studies. The information's already there. Um, as an example, um, I know in my home county, this was probably a couple months ago now at least, uh, they were talking about how the jail, we no longer house inmates from other counties because we've got the jail full all on our own. And um, we've got a, a newer, uh, <coughs> what should be a, a large jail that's a, way more than we need in Hubbard County, but it's pretty much at capacity, and they said, 
85% of those people in jail were because of driving under the influence of drugs. Um, and that's why, you know, as I go through this whole thing, it's so concerning is we're already tapping out our, our, our jails, our public safety things. I mean, they're at capacity and we're, we're gonna add more to their workload. But anyhow, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I chuckle at the fact that we gotta replace all our drug dogs. I mean, all of these things are kind of crazy. The fact that uh, we're going to uh, look to change all this. Um, I got a couple more here that I'll. S it we had talked in. It was even part of the amendments. These uh, the labels that are going to be on these products. Um, do we think people will actually, that'll make a difference? I mean, we see it already in our current uh, substances. Um, they're more after, I guess, if you want to call it their enjoyment or their fun or whatever, they're not going to be concerned about if it says a certain thing or not. But um, school programs, I've jumped ahead. I'm on page 185, um, and it talks about the school starting in 2026, 2027, um, that they need to start, they must implement a comprehensive education program on cannabis use and substance use for students in middle and school and high school. It once again showing how bad this is, but the big thing is it's a mandate to the schools. It's one more thing that's on their plate. Um, they're trying to educate our students, and now, you know, how big a deal do you think do you envision that? What is this something that they just have uh, put out some flyers and talk about it once or twice during a year? Or do you think this is more part of a class that's going to take more emphasis to drive home what this product will do and the effect it could have on young people? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Ucky. Um, as is on 185.2, it, it lays out that the Commissioner of Education puts must put together a model program. So I am I'm not a teacher. Um, I am not an expert in that area, and we do have experts, uh, and that's why we refer to them in this bill to help put together that program. I I. I shouldn't be the one uh, who's sort of writing uh, that program because I'm not an expert in education. Um, and that's why we defer in this bill to the department to help put together a model program that school districts can then use. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, now I'm back to, I guess it would be the end of Article 6. And there's a repealer with about three quarters of a page of stuff that's repealed. Can you highlight what's included in there without having to go through all of those? Um, what are we taking out of statute or I probably changing statute, but could you give us a brief overview of what's all repealed? Uh, perhaps council could go through uh, some of the repealers. So, Senator Atke, are you speaking of page um, well, 213? Yeah, I'm on page 213 and 214, but um, I was just kind of looking for a high level, but um, we don't need to, uh, unless council's got a quick and easy answer, we don't need to go there at this time. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Atke, I believe the repealer is repealing all of the medical current medical cannabis okay. uh, language and then it will be re-put into statute. Okay. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for that. And that kind of was what I was anticipating, but uh, that, that answers that. So um, with that, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I okay. got through what I was kind of targeting or wanting to get more information on. Any other members with questions? No. Um, any other members who have uh, comments about the bill or at this point? No? All quiet. 
Senator Port, do you have uh, some closing thoughts for us? I, I just I want to thank the committee for its time and and engaging on the issue. I think um, you know I, I want to state for the record that you know those of us who are working on this bill do take it seriously. Uh, this is not something we are flippantly um, moving without thought. Uh, this is something we're taking very seriously and. We're taking it seriously because it has done significant harm to our communities. The prohibition of cannabis has done significant harm to our communities. And we see it as critical that we um, do what we can to undo that harm. Is this bill perfect? No. It's 300 pages now. Uh, it's, it's going to continue to have changes as we move through the process. And I think that that is good for the bill. Um, I think it's good that we have these conversations. Um, I think it's good that we continue to talk and uh, ask questions and learn from each other because our goal is to make this the best bill. Um, I do think we have things in this bill that are taking the best parts of what have worked in other states um, to get at some of the concerns, uh, particularly on the illicit market. We have seen major drops in some states. Montana, for one, went from about 80, uh, after they, after they um, legalized, 100% of the use pre-legalization was through the illicit market. Now over 80% of it is through the regulated market. That's a massive drop. Um, and part of the reason that that worked is because they didn't have uh, areas of the state that could continue prohibition. So there weren't blocks of counties and um, areas where cannabis was still prohibited, um, which killed out much of the illicit market. So we're, we're trying to take lessons from those states. We're learning from what has worked in other states to to curb uh, use among young people, to stop that initial first use, which is peer-to-peer -peer education, far outshines everything else above and beyond. Um, and so, you know, I, I really do appreciate the engagement and I am happy to continue to work with folks as this continues through its process. I think it's about halfway through its committee steps now. Um, and so we still have a long way to go. Um, and my door is always open to continue these conversations and I thank the committee for its engagement. Thank you, Senator Port. And yes, I, I appreciate the, all the work that you've put into um, taking in feedback as you go along and, and taking steps to act on the feedback. And I, I hope that that, um, that will continue. Uh, from my standpoint uh, in this committee, I'm, I appreciate that there are a lot of um, proactive efforts planned regarding um, education of youth and education of of adults on um, the health impacts, and that we can learn from other states, you know, what has been particularly helpful in these areas, and that we can keep um, continuously improving the program so that we are taking note of any, you know, areas where we're seeing negative in impacts and we're trying to address them um, through means and education and programs that we develop. So I appreciate the discussion in this committee and um, appreciate members your, your full discussion of the bill. Um, Senator Mann, would you please make the motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I uh, move that Senate File 73 um, be recommended to, as, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to Human Services. On Senator Mann's motion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? No. The uh, motion does prevail. The um, Senate File 73 as amended. Um, does pass and will be referred to the Committee on Human Services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now, members, we will move to um, the other seven bills that we have on the um, schedule for today. Um, the first bill that we have on coming up now is Senate File 1814, which is a Senator Fate bill, and Senator Mann is presenting for um, Senator Fate. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
And Senator Mann, please. Um, Senate go ahead, file proceed. 1814 appropriates um, $500,000 in one time funding for the Department of Health to develop a public health campaign on Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Currently, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia and accounts for 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases. Dementia will worsen with time and is, there is currently no cure. However, we can slow its progression and improve patients' quality of life if it is diagnosed early. An important part of this bill is that the Department of Health must develop culturally relevant messaging tailored to underserved communities including rural populations, native and indigenous communities, and communities of color. The reason for that is, for example, uh, black people are twice as likely to have dementia, Latinos are one and a half times as likely. These racial disparities are driven by social determinants of health and not by genetic factors. Facing these racial disparities, the need for culturally relevant messaging on aging is more important than ever. Early detection has shown improved quality of life by empowering people with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia to connect with loved ones and meaningfully participate in treatment planning. It gives people time to take proactive steps to slow the progression of disease and it saves the state money. An early diagnosis delays nursing home placement. And with that, Madam Chair, we do have some testifiers today. Good morning. Thank you, and uh, before you proceed, uh, can you please state your name for the record and then begin your testimony? My name Welcome is, to the committee. Good morning. My name is Tuesday Glover. Thank you. I'm going to start my little speech here. So good morning. My name is Tuesday Glover, and I work for Volunteers of America, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I am the director of the Culturally Responsive Caregiver Support and Dementia Services Program. Volunteers of America of Minnesota and Wisconsin is a nonprofit health and human services organization committed to serving people in need, strengthening families, and building communities. For 125 years, Volunteers of America in Wisconsin has offered comprehensive range of innovative services and networks that respond to and involve with needs of community in the pursuit of its mission to help people build hope, resilience, and well-being. I am here today to, to rep representing the work and the services which I lead, the culturally responsive caregiver support and dementia services team. This service historically focused on supporting African American and East African community members throughout it, through education relating to dementia, offering memory screens and supporting caregivers. The stress, the stress health impacts and costs associated with long journey of caring for someone impacted by dementia often creates two or more people who are in desperate need of support. Our work supporting caregivers relates, reveals the importance of the impact of offering respite to caregivers. As she mentioned, dementia a disease of the brain is fatal. This vicious disease can affect memory, ex executive functioning, day-to-day -day living, and decision making. Those impacted by the disease will eventually forget their loved ones' names, forget who they are, and forget to eat meals daily. They will need a caregiver. This caregiver journey can be stressful and self-care is vital. Without proper self-care, statistics show that the, care, uh, the caregiver will expire before the care receiver due to the demanding duties and stressors that come along with being a caregiver. As a speaker on behalf of caregivers, I'm sorry. As a speaker on behalf of my clients and caregivers in the Twin City area, caregivers respite I feel is in crisis. Our program advocates for caregiver self-care. Our clients are seeking respite services so they are able to go to the doctor, their doctor's appointments, go to the dentist, or even just get a haircut um, for an average 
the average cost for respite services is $30 to $40 for private pay an hour with a three hour minimum, averaging $120 for three hours. Most of our caregivers are retired and did not plan financially for respite services. The, caregiver, the culturally responsive caregiver support and dementia services program has recently collaborated with the VOA Volunteers of America program called AmeriCorps. It's a senior program to recruit volunteers to assist with short-term respite services for our present clients so they can have respite service while they enjoy our dementia and brain education health classes. I ask that the state of Minnesota create more funding for caregivers who care for older adults and as they care for their loved ones with dementia independently in their home for as long as they possibly can. Again, thank you for having me and allowing me to advocate on behalf of caregivers, volunteers of America, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and the culturally responsive caregiver support and dementia services team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now you have a second testifier, Edelmira Mont Montalvo. Madam Chair, I'll be uh, reading a translation of her testimony. Okay. My Thank name you. is Sam Smith of the Alzheimer's Association. Welcome, welcome to the committee. Uh, please uh, state your name uh, for the record. Mi nombre es Edelmira Ida Montalvo. Nací en San Juan, Puerto Rico. Y he venido a Minnesota con mi esposo hace ocho años. Hace poco diagnosticaron a mi esposo con la condición de Alzheimer. Si yo no hubiera eh, tenido la oportunidad de aprender las diez señales de advertencia del Alzheimer en español, mi esposo nunca hubiera recibido un diagnóstico temprano. My name is Edme Edelmira Ita Montalvo. I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and have lived in Minnesota with my husband for eight years. My husband was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. If I would not have had the opportunity to learn about the warning signs in Spanish, my husband never would have received an early diagnosis. Desde hace ocho años, yo participo en el programa de los sabios, nuestros sabios mayores del Centro Tairón Guzmán, donde aprendí eh, sobre la condición del Alzheimer. Participé en una obra uh, de teatro original en español llamada El Orden del Desorden para crear conciencia y educar sobre las diez señales de alerta. Tristemente, pocos años después, empecé a reconocer algunas de estas señales en mi esposo. Cuando se lo mencioné a su doctora de cabecera o la primaria, eh, ella descartó y nos dijo que, que era la pérdida de, de memoria normal para los envejecientes. Y entonces, por lo que yo había aprendido ya, sabía que a mi esposo le estaba pasando algo que no era normal. Pasamos más de tres años insistiendo con varios médicos hasta que por fin hace unos meses le dieron el diagnóstico formal de la condición de Alzheimer. Eight, eight years ago, I began participating in Centro Tyrone Guzman's Wise Elders Program, where I learned about Alzheimer's and even participated in an original play in Spanish to promote awareness of the 10 warning signs. Sadly, just a few years later, I started to notice these signs with my husband. When I told his primary care doctor, she dismissed my concerns as normal memory loss caused by aging. Because of what I had learned, I knew that what my husband was experiencing was not normal. It took more than three years of insisting, going from doctor to doctor. And finally, just a few months ago, my husband received a formal diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. La educación y recursos que recibí en el Centro Tyrone Guzmán me dieron la confianza y las herramientas para seguir luchando hasta recibir un diagnóstico. Aun cuando los médicos dudaban y no, no escuchaban mis preocupaciones. 
The education and resources I received at Centro Tyrone Guzman were what gave me the confidence and the tools I needed to continue fighting until we received a diagnosis, even as medical professionals doubted and minimized my concerns. La mayoría de los latines de, en Minnesota no han tenido la oportunidad que he tenido yo. Por eso muchos están cuidando a familiares con la condición de Alzheimer sin un diagnóstico formal, perdiendo la oportunidad de cambiar el progreso de la enfermedad y de mejorar la calidad de vida para las personas. Se necesita más educación y más campañas culturalmente apropiadas en español para crear conciencia y aumentar las tasas de la detención temprana y el diagnóstico formal. Gracias. Most Latinas in Minnesota have not had the opportunities that I have had, which is why so many are caring for family members with Alzheimer's without a formal diagnosis, missing out on opportunities to slow the progression and improve quality of life. More Alzheimer's education and awareness campaigns that are culturally appropriate and in Spanish are needed to increase rates of early detection and diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for coming today. Um, having no other uh, testifiers, members, do you have any questions about the bill? Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. and. Uh, uh, I'll have one little question at the end, but just more of a comment to start with. And uh, um, for Mr. Smith, I'm glad to see the language of this bill because we had conversations around it last year where it just says, you know, it's directed at the general population because we know there's no one that's exempt from suffering from this uh, horrific disease. But as we just heard, getting it expanded into um, languages and areas so that we do cover the general population. So that, that, that's good. Um, I like that. And then just at the end, um, we talk about it's a half a million dollar appropriation, but the amount that can be used by the department for the report is still blank. Does anybody have an idea of what number will go in there? Because I'm hoping it's as small as possible so that the vast majority goes towards this project. Uh, Mr. Smith, if you have an answer, otherwise, I just just for the record, we we have requested a fiscal note. So, um, if the department, you know, they would be the one, I think, to create the. the uh, Madam report. Chair, Senator Rucky, thank S you for the question. And that that blank appropriation speaks specifically to the reporting requirement around this this uh, public awareness campaign, and I I think we all agree that we hope that a majority of the resources go into the public awareness campaign and especially engaging the communities most impacted by Alzheimer's disease so that they can help to develop the culturally relevant messaging. But if you're looking for more details, we'll have to wait for a fiscal note. Um, Senator Rocky. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and my question, I guess, to you is this bill, does it stay in our committee? So yes. at this point, we lay it over until over. we know what that is? Yes. Okay, good. So we'll still have a chance to weigh in and keep that number down so that we can uh, do good work with the rest of it. So thank you. All right. Yes. Uh, members, any other questions or comments about the bill? No? Um, any closing comments, Senator Mann? No? Well, I, I appreciate your bringing the bill forward. I, I do think that um, as we learn more about uh, what is effective in um, coming to a better understanding of uh, early detection and discussing the benefits of doing the work early. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we need to make sure that, that all communities have access to the information. So I appreciate bringing the bill forward and the bill will be laid over for um, consideration in a future bill. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Senate File 988, which is Senator Bolden's bill. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Please go ahead with your um, presentation. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is a very simple bill. Um, it was brought to me by the Board of Dentistry. It does two things. Um, it modifies the language and statute in two places where it says assisting and should say assistant, just a technical change. And it adds a line. Um, each licensee must submit a non-refundable $5 fee to request a mailing address list. So this um, is language that was inadvertently, accidentally um, omitted in the drafting process for the Board of Dentistry's larger policy bill last year. So it's just correcting that omission. Um, and it puts it in line with um, what um, is available for other boards and that licensees can request a list um, from the board. Currently, uh, requesters must purchase um, licensee mailing lists from the Minnesota bookstore, um, but the Board of Dentistry has the ability to provide um, this information, and so they are just asking for a $5 fee to do that, which, as I said, is in line with what other boards do. So very simple change um, just brought because it was omitted from the bill last year. Members, any comments or questions about the bill? Senator Abler. Thanks, um, Madam Chair. And, you know, a $5 fee is uh, the trend we should be looking at. It probably almost costs that much just to collect it. But as the Department of Health looks for their reporting, you know, I think there's a lesson to be taken across government that if you can do something for five bucks at the board level, then maybe some of these agencies can make those uh, reports pretty lean and frugal, and more money can go into helping the people. So they're always happy when we suggest that. So. I'm here to help. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, and I do, will call your attention. There is a fiscal note that we received, and there is no um, no state cost. Um, this bill will will pass um, this bill, and it will go to the floor for um, act, action on the floor. So, um, any other questions or comments? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor. Of uh, well, Senator Bolden, can you can you can make your own motion? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, would move that this uh, bill be passed uh, or recommended to pass um, and re referred to the floor. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. The Senate File um, 988. Um, does pass and will be, um, it does pass. Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Senate File 1129, which is Senator Hoffman's bill. Welcome, Senator Hoffman, to the test to the. Uh, presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had to raise the chair up because it's I was sitting down here. So, um, uh, members, there's an A1 amendment. Uh, it's attached. I'd like to move that first. Senator Hoffman moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now that it is in the bill of the form that I want it to be in, I I want to. Uh, welcome Sarah Goodno uh, to the table here as well, but this is um, this addresses a huge um, issue patient advocates and hospital providers have been running into, which is that patients with G-tubes have been running into prior authorization issues. Let me just pause right there. Prior auth on everything is just absolutely beyond. Um, lived experience myself, uh, but this also rolls into the preferred drug list where children with feeding tubes are unable to access the liquid versions of needed medications. Um, this one is a large issue, and that's why I'm here in front of you to do that. And so the Drug Formula Committee, DFC otherwise, if you want to get another acronym in your world, is responsible for managing Minnesota's public health care program's preferred drug list and evaluates whether drugs covered by public programs should be subject to prior auth and what the prior authorization criteria should be. All we're saying in, in, um, in our um, Senate file 1129 is we would modify the composition of the drug formulary committee and update the process for making changes to the preferred drug list to increase the diversity of provider ex expertise and center the patient experience and include the transparency in the process. 
and there's just the addition of three consumer representatives uh, to that, which the committee, including rare, di rare disease disability pediatrics. And so um, what, I, what I'd ask is that Sarah Goodnow, who's the advocacy and public policy manager of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, can speak uh, more on behalf of the bill. So thank you, Madam Chair and members. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Goodnow. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Wickland, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Goodnow, and I am the Advocacy and Public Policy Manager at the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. I am here today to testify in support of Senate File 1129, which will modify the Drug Formulary Committee composition and make changes to the process of updating the preferred drug list. The Drug Formulary Committee and the preferred drug list have a significant impact on how people who use medical assistance are able to access medications in Minnesota. The Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota supports adding additional consumer representatives and providers with expertise in rare disease, disability, and pediatrics because that diversity of thought, practice, and information will encourage the committee to look beyond the explicitly clinical data and into the lives of patients. Such as a child with a rare epilepsy diagnosis whose parents need to crush her pills daily and feed them to her and her food because the preferred drug list and the prior authorization criteria wouldn't cover a liquid version for her. This is just one example. We have heard similar stories where prior authorization is of a liquid version of a medication is repeatedly denied for children using feeding tubes, which could lead to crushed pills clogging their G-tube. In these cases, the method of application is not a matter of convenience, but could be a matter of life or death. This may sound dramatic, but for epilepsy and a number of other chronic conditions, a single missed dose can have significant consequences. Diverse clinical and patient experience and expertise as voting members of the Drug Formulary Committee is essential to ensuring that the best decisions are made with people who are directly impacted by those decisions. I encourage your support for Senate File 1129, and I am happy to take <coughs> your questions. Thank you. And I believe that's your only testifier. Members, do you have any questions? Uh, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no question, but I just wanted to thank Senator Hoffman for bringing this bill forward. Uh, prior authorization is a nightmare for patients and providers. It causes harm, delays care, increases burnout. Um, this is low-hanging fruit, so thank you very much for advocating for patients this way. Uh, Senator Hoffman, any? Uh, thank you, Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is, uh, it is low-hanging fruit. You, you wonder why we set up all these roadblocks to getting to effective patient-centered experience, and this one is one little small little uh, movement toward that. So I appreciate you hearing this bill and passing it. Uh, Senator Ebler. Well, and just to pile on, uh, Senator Morrison already just did a pretty good job of commenting about it, but it's just to echo uh, some of these uh, prior authorizations cost money, more money than they're worth. Uh, they only save money by denying care that's necessary or delaying it, and some of the harm that happens from these policies is really bad, and I don't understand why the plans continue doing this, and we have to pass a law to say, could you use your head and actually care about the clients? And for what we pay uh, for our health care and to deny some of these things that even are almost 100% approved by the time you get around to it, just makes no sense at all, and it just adds to the administrative cost. And so thanks for the Epilepsy Foundation, and thanks, Senator Hoffman. To that point, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Hoffman. Both doctors' points, absolutely. My own lived experience, I, I had to apologize, feel like I had to apologize to uh, my daughter's own primary care physician because she was spending more time routing paperwork than she was trying to um, do the work that she was is paid to do and do well, and 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 then to appeal and to fight every time you turn around. Um, you know what? Let's let's just make it right and do it right first. So I appreciate the comments and I appreciate passing this bill. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Yeah, thank you for bringing this forward. And uh, the the bill needs to go to the committee on state and local government and veterans. So if you could make the motion to um, uh, recommend it that um, Senate File 1129 be recommended to pass as amended and be re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. 
May I ask, Madam Chair? Uh, Question. Uh, I'm yes. going to need some advice on why is it going to state and local government? I, um, state and local government has requested it. The chair. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. And Senator Hoffman, maybe it affects uh, CGIP? Because they run that there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you know what the judge? And Madam Chair, to that point, I just, uh, I, I understand things getting referred, but what would be the other alternative for this bill if it was not referred to that committee? Because um, I just it don't could be understand. Laid over. I mean, we have, I believe there will be a fiscal impact, so we'll need, or, or won't there? We'll ask council here. Thank you. Council believes that the bill refers to the formulary committee, which the state and local government would have jurisdiction over committees like that. So. Thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, clarifying that. And changing the expiration dates. Okay, that, that's fair enough. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, doing that because it's one of those moments where you wonder why it's going someplace that... That's, yes, it's perfectly fine to ask the question about that. Can you make the, um, the motion on your bill? Then? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I make a motion that we, as amended, refer the bill to uh, state and local government. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the motion does prevail, and Senate File 1129, as amended, um, does pass and is re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is Senate File 441, which is Senator Morrison's bill. Senator Morrison, you have um, Senate File 441. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members, I appreciate the opportunity to present Senate File 441. This bill would direct the Commissioner of Health to study and implement a statewide electronic database for provider orders for life-sustaining treatment or pulsed forms. Pulsed forms are a valuable tool for medical providers to outline patient treatment preferences. The form outlines patient treatment preferences like whether to transfer, not to transfer, resuscitate, do not resuscitate, et cetera. Pulse forms are not for all patients. They're meant for severely ill patients receiving end-of-life treatment. They are medical orders, not an advanced directive, and explicitly outline the treatment a patient wants or does not want. Currently, when a provider authorizes a pulse form, the patient is given a paper copy. If a patient misplaces the form, it gets damaged, or they don't have it with them in an emergency, it's likely that their end-of-life preferences will not be followed. With today's technology, patients should have their pulse form accessible without having a physical copy present. Pulse forms are especially valuable in case of emergency. When emergency care providers arrive on a scene, they may not even know of a patient's pulse form unless the form is readily available. This can lead to liability issues for emergency providers. Many EMS responders can share horror stories where family members are screaming at them not to resuscitate or transfer because they have that outlined in their pulse form, but they don't have the physical form. This has actually happened in my family. It's pretty awful. Um, so this bill forms an advisory committee of stakeholders who will look into the recommendations about how to best implement the registry, such as how to update it when changes are made to a patient's pulse, who's charged with securing these forms, et cetera. A standardized pulse form was developed in 2008 and finalized in 2010. It is widely used and recognized by hospital systems, long-term care facilities, medical professionals, and EMS throughout Minnesota today. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, I do have a testifier today. Dr. Nicholson, I believe, is here. Thank you, and welcome to the committee. Um, Dr. Nicholson, please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. All right, we're, can you hear me? All right, we're going from pediatric feeding tubes to end of life care, so thanks for hanging in there, you guys. <laughs> uh, my name is Will Nicholson. I'm the chair of the Minnesota Medical Association, and I'm a family physician 
and I uh, practice as a hospitalist in the East Metro. I'm sorry, I'm the president of the Minnesota Medical Association. I'm here to support SF441. Uh, this bill is needed to ensure that my patients' health care decisions at the end of life are known and followed. Post is, Pulse is something that empowers patients. Uh, it stands for Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. That's Provider Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It's important because these are orders. They're not uh, intentions or feelings. They're orders that a provider writes for their patient, with their patient, and they're a critical tool that physicians and patients used to document patient preference for treatment in some of their most important phases, phases of life change. At the end of life, uh, we know that we overtreat patients, that we do things that they don't want because it is the sort of baseline that we follow. And this gives patients a chance to describe what they want at the end of life rather than following the standard process. Um, they've been widely used in Minnesota to good effect. Uh, Long-term care facilities, medical professionals, EMS, hospitals, all have been using them for about 10 years. Um, and they basically allow us to all be on the same page. The problem is, um, you know, years ago we were mandated to buy these fancy medical records. We we're not mandated to have them all talk to each other. And the patients get stuck in the middle. So currently, most pulse forms exist as paper forms that a patient physically carries. And as the center outlined, there are a number of scenarios where those copies of those forms get misplaced, damaged, or inaccessible. And when an EMS uh, provider or an emergency department doesn't have access to pulse, uh, it puts them in the very difficult situation of possibly giving, unintentionally giving um, care that a patient doesn't want. If you put yourself in the in the place of the patient or their family member, um, you know, you can imagine sitting down and having the difficult conversation about end of life, documenting this with your doctor, and then at the moment that you're sick and you're in need of help, um, you don't get what you need. Patients wake up in hospital beds after documenting that they never wanted to leave their homes. Families of patients that don't wake up have to make hard decisions about terminating care that the patient never wanted in the first place. And healthcare providers have to reckon with the fact that we have delivered patient care that nobody wanted uh, after swearing to first do no harm um, and, and, and realizing that we're doing this because we just have a system that depends on paper. You know, I think the, um, the tragicness and the preventability of this is difficult to explain unless you've really been there. Um, but we have much better communication tools now. Uh, we need to use them. And SF441 um, directs the Commissioner of Health to form an advisory committee for healthcare providers, oh, I'm sorry, of healthcare providers, patients, ethicists, attorneys, EMS, and religious community leaders to study and recommend how to implement a statewide online registry for Pulsed. We've been able to do this on other medical topics, on immunizations, on opioids. They've been incredibly helpful. Uh, this can be something that could be accessed by healthcare providers at any time from anywhere. And as a physician, I want to ensure, you know, that every patient's wishes are known and followed. A statewide registry for Pulsed will help ensure that for our patients, and uh, it will help us stop delivering unneeded care. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this subject. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, do you have any questions about the bill? Uh, um, Senator Abler? Oh. I don't know if I was in line. Um, anyway, well, I appreciate, um, I think I was a co-author on this last year, if I remember. Um, and so I remember with my dad, uh, who finally passed a year and a half ago um, at home on Veterans Day, which was just as good as it could be. Um, he had this envelope that they had three copies of it and take it to Florida, come back, and, and so uh, luckily they never needed it. Um, but I, and so that's, I appreciate the bill and the good doctor describing how it's gonna help. Um, so I just have a question about the process of people writing up their pulse on Hollywood, <laughs> how you say it correctly. Um, so these are a doctor sitting down or a 
whatever care team sitting down with the family and they just kind of give and take and then they write down everybody is engaged and uh, these are uh, no one's complained about this but the process seems like it's evolved pretty far that uh, people are just really there's a big there's a strong agreement about what's written down and the doctor would give advice and the family would go like yeah or no and the woman or man who's the target would pretty much agree. Do they have to sign it themselves? And can you just comment about that process? Sure. So, um, Dr. Nicholson. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, Senator, my, uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, our standard for for decision making uh, weighs heavily on autonomy and informed consent. And so, the vast majority of these scenarios are, are patients that have been facing end of life challenges for a long time. Uh, most of the time. They have already had you know, the, the process of putting together an advanced uh, directive of establishing code status. Uh, and this is a, an added layer of specificity and insurance that what they want to have happen uh, will happen. They're generally done as a group decision, in my experience. It's usually not just a patient. It's a patient and their family or loved ones, uh, as well as, as their uh, health care providers. Um, and they are hard decisions. Our goal is not to um, you know, counsel as much as it is to empower and help people understand what each of the decisions at end of life means because most of us have never died before. Uh, so we, <laughs> so I know it seems obvious, but, but we haven't put a lot of thought into it. And so a lot of what providers do is talk about, you know, the risks, the benefits, and, and the options and, and help patients understand what the best thing for them and their goals may be. Yeah. No, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. I just, uh, I've never heard anybody complain about it, but it's just nice to hear how collaborative it is. And anyway, well, thank you. And, and I, I should add, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Nicholson. Oh, sorry. Um, patients can change these at any time. Just like anything in healthcare, the patient can change their mind. And, you know, our goal is to meet the needs of the patient, not... Uh, hold them to some standard that we established a day and a half ago. Thank you. Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I was throughout the uh, testimony, and I think you touched on it right at the end, because I was wondering if this is something that needs to be created from the ground up new, but I think you said there's kind of a system out there for medications and opioids currently where this could be kind of attached so that, I mean, is there a system that does spread some information now that this could be attached to, uh, or is, do we have to create a whole new network to, to do what we're trying to do here? Uh, Dr. Nicholson or Senator Morrison, I, I don't know. Th thank you, Senator. I, I, from the standpoint of a person who uses these systems on a daily basis, I don't know the answer to how best to do this, and I think that's why we talked about establishing a, a task force in this bill to get a, a group of experts and community stakeholders to help guide the process. But I, I'm, I'm not an expert in how best to do that. Okay. Senator Rodkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's what I was looking for, is to, because um, it, it does talk about forming a committee, and I didn't know, so they're kind of building this from ground up, so to speak, to create this whole process. So that's what I was after. Thank you. Thank you. And then just for members' information, we have requested a fiscal note, and it, so we will be getting that. We'll be laying the bill over today. So any other member questions? Well, I appreciate your being, bringing the bill forward. I had um, a relative, my husband's grandmother lived a very long time, past 100 to be 107, and I remember that the family created or worked together with their physicians to create a, a pulsed a form, and I was kind of surprised that they would, you know, hang it on the refrigerator and then kind of hope that that would work out for every, you know, possible time that they might have a case where, you know, emergency personnel would be sought or come to the home and who knows who is there and who would recognize whether this form would be observed. Um, so I appreciate your bringing the bill forward. It seems like a good um, a good thing to study and, and to figure out if there's a better way to, to make sure that people are, you know, that there are, their wishes are being followed the way that they, they have directed. So... Thank you. And we will be laying the bill over for possible consideration in a future bill. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
And next, um, Senator Morrison has another bill, uh, Senate File 836. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Madam Chair members, I appreciate the chance um, to present Senate File 836. You know, we've all witnessed the growing stress that our young people face today. Um, and we've heard testimony in many of our committees about the need for mental health support in our schools and communities. While the stress our students face existed before COVID-19 and of course will exist after, the pandemic has shown a harsh light on the lack of support and a safety net for those students who are struggling. This bill is a small step we can take to give our students the tools they need to access mental health supports before they become dire. In current law, a 16 and 17 year old is allowed to check themselves into an inpatient facility of their own accord but cannot access the help of a mental health professional in an outpatient setting without parental permission first. Uh, so with this bill, it's our hope that young adults um, will get the help they need long before requiring a hospital stay. Delaying urgent care can be costly in so many ways. Sometimes these delays can be as simple as a language barrier or time constraints for the parents of the student, or it may just be lack of knowledge about the resources that are available. Whatever the case may be, we want our young kids, our young adults, excuse me, to get needed help without that costly delay. And members, you should have two letters of support um, in your packet for this bill from NAMI and the Minnesota School Psychologist Association. Uh, and I believe I have testifiers today, Madam Chair. Yes, I, there is a testifier, Oscar Wolf, who is joining us on the Zoom. Welcome to the committee and please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Oscar Wolf. I'm a senior at, at Hopkins High School over in the West Metro, uh, and I'm here to testify in support of this bill. About a year ago, I was in French class when a friend of mine had a panic attack. I watched her freeze up. I saw her eyes get panicky, uh, and I knew pretty quickly that something wasn't right. So I flagged down my teacher, and we were able to get my friend uh, to the nurse's office. Unfortunately, on that particular day, there was no mental health specialist uh, in the school, so my friend had to wait for about an hour and a half in an empty room before she was able to be seen by someone. You would think that after a traumatic experience like that, uh, my friend would need some sort of mental health care to, to help cope with that. Uh, but in my friend's case, one of the major contributing factors to her mental health issues was her situation at home, was her parents. Uh, so because she knew that if she were to use those mental health resources, they would be calling home, she just didn't seek them out at all. Uh, the truth is that if this bill had existed a year ago, my friend would have received the mental health treatment that she needed. In the years that I've been in high school, I've actually seen the resources available improve a lot. Hopkins now offers psychologists and social workers and therapists and a lot of that wasn't available when I was a freshman. However, given how many students are in need of these resources, it's pretty surprising how underused they are. And one of the major reasons for that is because students know that they don't have that confidentiality. Their parents are going to know. Uh, at Hopkins, almost half of students are on free or reduced lunch. So going outside of school to get residential treatment or a private therapist is, option, is often just not a reasonable option. So we need to make sure that we tear down every barrier that's making uh, these resources in school inaccessible to students, especially uh, our lower income students. I really do empathize with the parents who might view this as a loss of control on their end. But as a student who's watched this rule play out uh, in schools, in the real world, uh, parental consent has proved to be much more of an obstacle than a safeguard. So with that, I would urge you all on behalf of the students throughout Minnesota to support this bill in order to make mental health care more accessible for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today and thank for taking time to, <clears throat> to present your thoughts about the bill. Um, and Senator Morrison, any other comments before we go to questions? Madam Chair, no, I'm here to stand for questions. Members, any questions? Senator Abler? 
Well, thanks. And I haven't studied this and just heard about it now. It seems like it's I appreciate the testimony of the of the fellow there. I uh, sorry I didn't get his name. Um, so, as we discuss what minors can do on their own, um, with or without consent, with or without informing, I understand the problems that come in some of the relationships where they just aren't about to tell anybody. And I'm sure there's some students, some young people that have, you know, taken their own lives because they just didn't feel like they could talk about something, and you want to avoid that. But on the other side of the coin, is there, is there, is anybody expressed a concern about? that this disconnects from the family, that there are some actually good families out there that if they could talk, it would actually be useful. Um, I don't know where this bill is going next, but this, could you comment about that, Senator Morrison? Senator Morrison. M Madam Chair and Senator Abler, thank you for the question. You know, I think that most psychologists would tell you and other uh, mental health professionals would tell you that Ideally, the family's involved from the get-go, and that's usually the case, but there are circumstances where there's either a family situation or some of the examples that I mentioned in my opening remarks, either language barrier or lack of knowledge about mental health supports. Um, other things can be barriers for kids getting the help that they need, and the fact that they can consent to inpatient mental health treatment, but not outpatient, seems incongruous. So this just just brings in congruity and and expands access to our kids are in dire straits. We, we need to be being creative right now and doing everything we can to get them the help that they need. Thanks, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Well, I appreciate that. I don't think I'm an opponent. I just. Um, kind of agnostic at this point. Um, but just to remind everybody who likes this piece of legislation, uh, the parents are going to find out because they're going to get a bill in the mail um, from wherever they went. Um, and, you know, they may go to a place that's not even the right place in their plan or I'm just in the thing of it all. So, um, so I mean, it's this actually... There's a side where it could cause some conflict. <laughs> like, oh, why didn't you go to the person who's, we have this whole network. It's like an amazing one. He went to this place and did not cover it. So just to point it out, I, I, um, those are logistical things that I don't know, you know how you fix. But I, I think you're on the right track. And um, that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, any other members? Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, <clears throat> Senator Aber touched on Part of where I was heading to was uh, about who pays. And, you know, you already touched on the fact that they can consent to inpatient, but this is outpatient care. But I was going to ask about the uh, who gets the bill. But if the bill is showing up at home afterwards and the, the fact of networks and all those things, um, you know, you know it, it's something I would like to know more on. But is there a fiscal note on this? Is there any? cost to the state if, we're, if it's public services we're paying, but do, do we anticipate there being more cost? I mean, we're already paying for one side of it. This is just kind of giving another option to them. Uh, Senator Morrison. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Adke, um, you know, I think that Mr. Wolf made a great point that, for example, in his high school, they have a lot of um, options currently that they didn't used to have, and they're not being utilized in his view to the extent that they're needed because of this barrier. Um, so that's part of their public education, so that would not be an additional cost. But if they went out into the community, that's true, um, that there would eventually be a bill, but it also to um, Senator Abler's point. But I would also point out that mental health professionals will tell you that in a scenario like this, often it'll take a visit or two, and then they will work with the student, with the young person, to bring their family in. So it's always the goal to involve the family. It may just be one or two visits to get the student to the point where they're able to do that. But that's always the goal of a good mental health professional, assuming that it's safe. Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you. I guess that's always a concern because uh, <laughs> sometimes that surprise bill in the mail creates more problems than we had before that as far as the, the young person and uh, in their relationship to their parents or guardians, whoever they're with. So um, we'll, we'll wait and see. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. It does seem like this um, will be uh, a benefit um, 
to expand the the options that students have or that young people have um, since they can already consent to some of these care um, services uh, it makes sense to me that we are able to um, have them give effective consent for the non-residential -res treatments as well so uh, I appreciate you bringing the bill forward um, this bill uh, will is does not have a fiscal impact and um, we will pass the bill out today to the floor so if you would like to make the motion um, uh, so moved madam chair <laughs> Uh, Senate file 836 is recommended to pass. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail and the bill is passed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now I will turn this over to Senator Mann for the, the two bills that I have. Madam Chair, please proceed. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to speak about um, Senate File um, 1680. Uh, this is a bill that makes uh, state funding available for fr family, friend, and neighbor support and education. Um, money was passed to support uh, this type of uh, child care. Uh, in the 2021 session and we used at that time uh, federal COVID funds were used and so we would like to uh, make this grant program um, continue on. Um, I'm really excited to be able to offer this important bill which supports family, friend and neighbor child care providers and helps ensure quality care and learning is available to all children regardless of where they get their care or who is their care provider. Uh, family, friend, and neighbor providers offer legal, unlicensed child care to children and families and are a frequent choice of care for parents with infants and toddlers, especially uh, parents in a diverse cultural and ethnic communities and parents with uh, differently abled children. Uh, parents working non-standard -stand hour jobs also um, make a lot of use of uh, family, friend, and neighbor providers. Uh, if you recall, uh, when we had the bill hearing on the Community Solutions Grant Program, um, one of the testifiers was from La Red, which is a, a, a program or a coalition in the Richfield Bloomington area, and they focus their efforts on providing training and um, other opportunities for family, friend, and neighbor providers. Um, every family should be able to choose who cares for their children when they work outside the home, um, and the cost of child care and shortage of child programs are often the driving forces between or behind uh, parents' decision making. Um, I know that there are many families um, in my community and across the state that want their children to be cared for by a family member or a friend who might share their cultural, uh, personal, or religious values. And I hope that um, we would be able to support um, those providers as well so that they can offer the highest quality care um, regardless of who is providing it. Um, so over the past, just as some background, um, over the past couple years, DHS has built a network of community supports for family, friend, and neighbor providers across the state. We appro approved $4.5 million in one-time funds to build this network and to get necessary resources to families and communities. These funds are scheduled to expire in 2023. Um, this bill would maintain funding for this new network and would allow for an expansion into the western counties of the state. 
Um, as you'll see in the bill, the grant awards can be used for a number of purposes, um, such as providing culturally and linguistically appropriate training, support, uh, resources to family, friend, and neighbor um, caregivers. They can use the grant money to connect the caregivers and children's families with community resources, um, connecting family, friend, and neighbor caregivers and children's families to early childhood screening programs and so on. Um, and I do have, um, I think, three testifiers today who are, I believe, are here with us remotely. And I'd like to go to the testifiers now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first up, we have Sue Thomas. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sue Thomas. I work for United Community Action Partnership. Um, we serve nine counties in South Central Minnesota. We provide a broad range of services uh, in the community and across the region, including rental and mortgage assistance, food assistance, refugee resettlement, and then my area of work supporting childcare and early learning. We work closely across our child care sector to support families, early childhood professionals, and other partners to improve the access to high quality child care, learning, and education for children. We know just as a solid foundation is the basis for a building to last through storms and years of use, a solid foundation of consistent, safe, nurturing, and culturally relevant care is the basis for a child to do well in school and in life. Um, in our community, there is both an incredible shortage of child care providers, but even fewer programs that serve children who speak a language other than English in their home. And because of the close work that we do with families, we know that families are looking for culturally relevant care and often use friend, family, neighbor child care to meet their needs um, because they know that those um, people that they are familiar with know um, their lifestyle. We also know that a large number of families work non-traditional hours um, and rely on friend, families, and neighbors to provide primary care for their children while they work. We believe that child care providers, no matter if they work in a licensed center, in a home program, in a school, that they, um, or if they're an unlicensed provider, they deserve to have the supports needed to provide the highest quality care possible. Those supports can be basic trainings on safety, the importance of talking is teaching, which is a program to encourage the value of healthy interactions, nutrition, and so much more. We are currently receiving funding from DHS through their FFN grant program to support FFN providers in our communities. This grant program is an opportunity for us to work with uh, DHS and our partners to learn how to best support FFN providers. Um, however, this grant, as you heard, is time limited and will be ending in September, and we need funding to increase body to child care and resources in the community. I'm very thankful that the state is beginning to think about how to continue the support for friend, family, neighbor care, and that this grant program has been one way that has an impact in our region of the state. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Next up, we have Coolia Pringle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, um, committee members. My name is Coolia Pringle, and I'm the Minnesota State Director for the National Parents Union. I'm here to testify on behalf of Senate File 1680 to establish Family, Friend, Neighbor, Child Care Grant Program. In my work, I work one-on-one -on -one to support families as they navigate pre-K um, area, predominantly Black, Brown, and low-income families. When the legislator decided to dedicate emergency funds to support family, friend, and neighbor providers, you supported 40% of families here in Minnesota, received the critical care they needed to support the growth and development of their children. FFN providers are trusted by the community they care for. Black, brown, and rural Minnesotans have been disproportionately impacted by the ongoing pandemic, and more families of all backgrounds have turned to their family, friends, and neighbors to help care for their young children. FFN grants allow providers to access training to help foster social emotional learning, healthy development, early literacy, and other skills needed to prepare children for school and, and, um, and a lifetime of learning. These resources help promote safe environments for children to be cared for and improves access to culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate care. 
We believe it is critical to provide quality care and support children and their providers, regardless of where they are getting care or who is providing the care. Please support me in supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pringle. Next up, we have Mia Roca. Good morning, chair members of the committee. My name is Mia Rocha. I am a family, fa I'm a family friend and neighbor navigator with Growing Up Healthy, a program of, initi of healthy community initiative in Rice County. Growing Up Healthy envisions a Rice County in which diverse populations are connected to each other and are active participants in creating a community where all families thrive specifically working with Latinx immigrant families and low-income families to cultivate neighborhood leadership, foster social connective, and collectively advocate for systems of level change to support all families. Growing Up Healthy received a grant from DHS to support FFN providers in Rice County. FFN providers report feeling disconnected from resources and services often because of language barriers or because they lack transportation and or financial resources to engage in broad community-wide programming. All services are being offered in Spanish and English so that FFN caregivers can get the information needed in their mother language. We also host various trainings for FFN caregivers, including Red Cross First Aid CPR in Spanish, to ensure they have the skills they need to create a safe environment for children in their care. Growing Up Healthy creates regular opportunities for FFN caregivers and families to connect in the community, both to each other and to, to supportive services that help them in their role caring for our youngest, for our youngest community members. We work with FFN caregivers and families to bring cultural and language into the care of the children. For multiple years, Growing Up Healthy has heard of barriers and challenges that FFN caregivers we are working hard to break down those barriers in partnerships with the FFN caregivers, families, and local leaders. We believe, on, we believe in ongoing funding is critical to our long-term goals of increasing social connectedness among all Rice County families, and grants like these can leverage other important, other important community programs. Thank you for your support of FFN providers in Rice County. We are excited to work with you and to ensure quality care is available in all Minnesota children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rocha. Uh, members, discussion. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Wickland, for bringing this. It, it, I started to smile because years ago, um, when I was at the University of North Carolina, Carol Trivet talked about kith and kin, you know, when you're talking about early childhood, and it was always wondering where that network was, and, and to me, it almost seems like this is modeled after the Washington State's um, FFN network that's that's enhanced and, and established there, and if that's the case, it would also, um, as they look at parsing out the, the early childhood stuff in Minnesota, is it your intention, I can't ask what your intent is, but is it your desire that this uh, follow along with that same path so it becomes embedded in how we do business in Minnesota. Senator Wicklin. Um, thank you, Senator Huffman. Um, Chair, I, yes, I, I mean, I hope that this, the, the money that we have been able to provide over the past couple years has shown that we can provide an effective path for grant money to go to these networks and to um, help support the family, friend, and neighbor providers in their own cultural um, and language specific way. Um, and so I think what the bill is intending to do is to create you know, more, um, more opportunities for that. And as we go forward, you know, to, to flesh out you know, more networks across the state so that more families can benefit from um, more well-trained providers. Senator. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Madam Chair and, and Senator Wicklin, it does. And I, I would hope that, I would hope, even though hope is not a strategy, that's the name of my kid, but the, um, the that's not funny, but um, in this case, as, as we start to look at all the different systems that are out there regarding this pocket of children and families, right? And I'm, I'm excited to see you bring this forward just because of that. It, it, it's bringing joy to the fact that 30 years ago we were having the same discussion and 
Um, there's other states that have done it. But I would hope that the department realizes the importance of this and, and, and sustains it regarding the conversation that's gonna be going forward when they start to look at all the early childhood services and programs in the state of Minnesota, because it's it, this is a worthwhile in, uh, investment and thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, and um, just to comment, I, the department did have some funding for uh, uh, the pre PDG grant money, was able to hire someone to, to do some project management and learning from this particular um, strategy, and so I think we're, I think they are very committed to uh, making it continue in a successful way. Other comments? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and, and the other Madam Chair. Um, the, um, I, I, I recognize uh, this idea. I think we did it with some of the money that we had uh, back in the big, cluster, big bomb of money landed on us, like over a billion or something. Um, but going forward, just a thought for you. I, I have a feeling that we might see this again in a, in a bill coming to us someday. Um, so, it, uh, and it seems like it's for legal and license in particular, which I think is a great idea. Uh, but as you work to put some more, uh, you know, structure into the program, you might want to just think, you know, what's a good size grant for people to get? How many do you want to try to get out? Uh, what, what about distribution across the state to make sure that it's, that it's covered, um, particularly in areas where there's uh, just a lack of, you know, child care, I suppose, in greater Minnesota in particular, but I'm sure there's some urban groups that would be really served by this as well. And so I just encourage you as you um, kind of, we, we did a lot of those programs really quick. And like we had, we spent, what was it, $600 million, I think, in a short amount of time. Frankly, behind the scenes, it was a lousy way to do business. Uh, some great programs came out of that, and maybe one of those is this, but just a thought as you go forward to not be shy to sit with your advocates and the department and get them some structure. And so the more structure there is, the less they have to spend on the admin side so you can mm -hmm. push more out the door. Thanks. Senator Wicklin, any thoughts? Thank you. No, I, thank you, um, Chair. Senator Abler, um, that makes a lot of sense, and I will definitely talk with him about, you know, if there's more language that we can include in the bill that will define things a little more, with a little more structure, so. Anyone else? Okay, um, Senator Wicklin, thank you for bringing this bill forward. It's brilliant, right? We're keeping kids in their communities. We're investing, put money back into those communities while fighting this childcare crisis we're having. It's a fantastic program. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to be added to it, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any final comments? Uh, no, I just um, would appreciate um, well, we will lay the bill over, so I don't need to have, ask for support today, but I, I do uh, hope that you see the value in making more resources available over time. And um, when we know that over 40% of infants and toddlers are, are being cared for in these settings, and uh, we want the people who are taking care of them to be um, able to be successful in these um, important year, early years of development. So uh, I appreciate the time and your attention today. Thank you. With that, the bill is laid over. And Senator Wicklin, to your bill, 1675. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate file 1675 is related to medical pricing transparency, and I do have an amendment, an author's amendment, so if I don't know if that's included in your packet. It's the A, A1 amendment. A1. So I'd um, like to move the A1 amendment. Uh, motion to move the A1. Everyone say aye. Those opposed? Aye. One aye. Okay, all right. The amendment is adopted. Thank you. And the amendment, um, it does clarify um, some it makes technical changes. Um, it will also um, changes the um, construction so that the, the hospital compliance is by January 1st of 2024, and then the other medical or dental practices, it gives another year for implementation of this, this bill. 
Um, so as I said, this bill has to do with medical pricing transparency. Over the past 20 years, um, mostly at the federal level, there's been a lot of discussion about how to reduce health care costs and maybe if we empowered consumers to be able to uh, make choices about their health care uh, based on understanding the quality and the, the price of the health care, that maybe that would be a way that we could um, reduce health care costs in our country. Um, there have been different efforts to put in place um, these different uh, proposals, and unfortunately, a lot of them didn't um, didn't help in terms of providing um, information about what um, patients need. Uh, to be able to shop for healthcare services. So what this bill works to do is to um, put more definition around what hospitals and other medical and dental practices must make available. Um, at the federal level, there was a requirement by 2020, beginning in 2021 for hospitals nationwide to publish their prices in a machine readable format. And um, this takes it a, a step further in terms of defining what that standard format is so that um, patients can actually make um, use of the information. Um, the rule in the beginning did not specify a particular format, and so hospitals could create a format of their own, and that made it very difficult for, for patients to be able to compare information across um, facilities. So Senate File 1675 would require Minnesota hospital systems to reorganizing, reorganize their existing files into this new format by next January. Um, because there are other um, providers of many shoppable medical services, services that can be planned in advance, such as radiology scans, orth orthopedic joint replacements, vision enhancement surgeries, and the like, um, they're not hospitals, but they're specialty practices. And um, the bill would require these practices um, in these specialties with over 50 million in annual revenues to publish their prices in the same format by January of 2025 so that their prices can be included in price comparison reports for consumers as well. Um, what this would look like in practice for consumers, um, there is a um, a website that you can go to today called Turquoise Health, and you can actually put in, um, you can enter what service you're interested in learning about, the name of the procedure, um, your zip code, um, and the tool responds with the cash price of that procedure at hospitals in your area. And if you do this, you can see that there is quite a, um, there is variation um, in cash prices for the procedure across the hospitals. Um, you can also um, drill down further and you can select the name of your own health plan and it can show you prices at that hospital for your health plan. So there is a lot of information that is available, but if um, hospitals are not using the same format, it makes it more challenging for, for people to, to get access to it. So with information like this, a healthcare consumer could for the first time be able to make an informed decision about where to have their expensive healthcare procedures performed based on, on price. Um, the turquoise tool does um, also include some information about CMS quality ratings, so it does have information about quality. <clears throat> and, um, and so they would be able to view information about price and quality. Um, Senate File 1675 um, does also ask the Department of Health um, it tasks them with developing um, or procuring a tool like this for Minnesota healthcare consumers. Um, there will be a fiscal note that will be developed um, to get information about um, what that cost would be for developing the tool or if they could um, purchase something that's already a, in existence. And I do have a testifier online today, Jean Abraham, who is a professor at the University of Minnesota. Ms. Abraham, please introduce yourself for the committee and proceed. 
Madam Chair and committee members, thank you. I am Jean Abraham, a health economist and professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. My remarks today represent my own views and not those of my employer. Today, more than 90% of Minnesotans with employer-based coverage have an annual deductible requirement with average amounts that now reach $4,200 per year for family coverage. Studies by the RAND Corporation and others also have documented rapid growth in commercial health plan prices and significant geographic specific variation. These factors together strengthen consumers' incentives to search for and use pricing information when making choices about the providers from whom they seek care. Comprehensive, accessible, and timely pricing data also support economic research to inform policymaking and regulatory actions to promote competitive healthcare markets. Many researchers, including myself, are investigating the implementation of the federal hospital price transparency regulation that went into effect in 2021. Researchers across the country also have begun to conduct analyses to measure hospital price variation for narrow sets of services or to quantify how prices vary by organizational or market attributes. However, the use of the actual machine readable data contained uh, that are posted online by hospitals has been very challenging to use given the lack of a standardized data structure format. So what value does SF1675 confer? First, requiring a particular file structure would facilitate the merging of files across hospitals and support analyses of important state policy relevant questions. For example, one can monitor how prices are changing over time for different segments of privately insured populations in local geographic markets. And one can analyze the relationship between changes in prices and provider market com competition. This is very important in light of increasing consolidation via merger and acquisition in both provider and insurer markets. Also, SF1675 converts value to consumers and employer purchasers by expanding the set of providers who will be reporting data. This is valuable because individuals' patients can increasingly ch choose to use outpatient settings in addition to hospital-based settings for many types of medical procedures. SF1675 is an important step in helping consumers make more informed choices about where and from whom they receive their medical care. And finally, it enables the research and policymaking communities to more effectively monitor price growth and price variation across providers, as well as how prices are changing with changes in the structure of provider and insurance markets. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abraham. Uh, members discussion. Uh, Senator Abler. Oh, thanks, and uh, Madam Chair. And Senator Wicklund, thanks for working on this. Just a thought again as you go forward. Uh, the, the term standard charge, uh, there's also uh, usual and customary. Um, there's what, uh, there's a, wait, wait, there's what we charge and there's what um, an average commercial company will pay, some are higher, some are lower. Uh, our PMAP reimbursements are low, but they vary considerably by a provider as well. And so, um, as you go forward working on this, and I hope you do, and I, in the past the hospitals have pushed back because it's just too hard or something. Um, I, there's a great use in some of this if you can just standardize what you're trying to do. And, but like the, you might also just consider uh, packages. Like if you're gonna go in for a delivery, some uh, hospitals that have different prices for different, that would include different things as part of their rate. And I, I don't honestly know how you get an accurate representation um, some places give a discount for cash, so if a person walks in with cash, what would that package cost? That would be something that would be kind of nailed down, I think, mm -hmm. uh, back in time. Uh, then Attorney General Hatch, uh, job-owned hospitals and giving people cash discounts, uh, something equivalent to the average commercial rate or something. Um, but just, a, it's, a, it's a really good idea, and especially if you can connect people to what stuff costs, they might realize that a hospital visit just isn't a $50 copay. So good luck on that. If you want me to help, I'm happy to pile on with you. But it's, it's, a, it's a worthy endeavor, so thanks. 
Thank Madam you, um, Madam Chair, um, Senator Blair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's there's work going on. I know that um, the author in the House, um, Representative Elkins, I, I want to acknowledge that he's done a lot of work on this um, this bill and, and some others. Um, in terms of really um, having people come together on um, standardizing the file format so that it can be accessible, I think you're right that the, you know, the next step of looking at, you know, what information is provided and how is it relevant to a, a particular patient, you know, this idea of standard charges, you know, what does it mean? Um, I think there's still a lot more work, you know, going on in terms of that. And, and you're right, there are times when you don't know exactly all the services you need, but you know you need your knee replaced or something like that. So um, coming up with a way to make sure it's um, accessible for people when they want to see information about a particular service that they're that that's available um, that would be helpful as well. So thank you. Members, other comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Wicklin, any final thoughts? No, I just, um, I see this as uh, one, uh, one more way that we can um, not only empower um, patients to understand um, healthcare costs better, but we can also provide a, a way for researchers, as Ms. Abram, Professor Abram has, has said, <clears throat> and look at um, costs um, over time. And by making sure that the format is standardized um, and that we have a tool to be able to view them, view the information, I think that that will help us make progress as we look at ways to understand and lower healthcare costs. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. And with that, the bill will be laid over. Um, Senator Wicklin, any other thoughts before we adjourn? Madam Chair. Um, yeah. oh. Senator Abler. So I have a question. So one way to get stuff done is threaten to stay till noon and then <laughs> we got it done. Um, there's, are there any other extended hearings this week or next that you're expecting that you can just give us a heads up on that you've, that you, don't, you don't have to you know, if you change your mind, but just so we can kind of think about it? Um, Madam Chair, um, Senator Abler, tomorrow we have our standard hearing time, 8.30 to 10.30. <clears throat> and then on Thursday, we are planning to um, use our time in the morning, but then we will also plan to come back at 6. So, and I believe that was, that has been posted and we're hoping to hear, we have some, several DHS policy bills that we'd like to get through because they need to go on to judiciary. And so we wanna get through a lot of items on Thursday that have to go to other committees. All right, thanks, appreciate it. Okay, with that we are adjourned.